Welcome to the Kingdom Christian Center broadcast. We're so excited you've tuned in to watch a life-changing message from our pastor, Lonnie King. This teaching has been designed to inspire you to live a better quality of life through Jesus Christ. Listen and enjoy. I'm telling you, boy, I'm just getting all kinds of goodies in this church life series. And uh, I believe that the word today is going to be enlightening. It's going to bless your life. Wasn't last week good, man? Talking about the love of God. Uh, so 1 Corinthians, everybody shout church life. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verse 16. I'm reading this. I was called the New Living Version. And uh, it says, so I ask you with all my heart to follow. This is what Paul is saying. I ask you with all my heart to follow the way I live. Okay? For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you. He is my much-loved child and a faithful Christian. He will tell you how I act as a Christian. Listen to this. This is the kind of life I teach in the churches wherever I go. So Paul is saying that there is this life that he teaches in the church. And he specifically said this is the kind of life. So I entitled my message today, This Kind of Life. Amen. Everybody say that with me. This kind of life. Yeah, this kind of life. And I'm going to explain this and it'll make sense here in a little while. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning and for all these, your people here under the sound of my voice. And uh, I pray, Father, that your word will find a lodging place in the hearts and minds of every person here. And that we'll leave here encouraged and inspired. We'll leave here not only touched but transformed by the authority of your word. And we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise for everything that will transpire this morning. In Jesus' name, let everyone who agree with that prayer say amen. Now, it is our custom for you to high-five as many people as you can and tell them this kind of life. Just tell them this kind of life. <laughs> you can be seated. Uh, when I was thinking about this and uh, preaching this, that scripture jumped out at me that Paul said, uh, talk to them about this kind of life uh, that I teach in churches wherever I go. So we're talking about church life. I want to talk to you about this kind of life. And Paul said, everybody say Paul said. Paul said, Paul said this is the kind of life that I teach. So I begin to think about what did Paul teach as it related to life as a Christian. And so that's where we springboard into this message from what Paul taught to the church. Uh, many of you know that Paul wrote uh, much of the New Testament. You know, all the epistles and Romans and Corinthians 1st and 2nd and Galatians and Ephesians. You know, all of those are Paul's writings. And Paul was masterful at writing. And one of the things he talked about was the Christian life in many of those epistles. And I like how this scripture frames it in the New Life Version. It says, this kind of life. And so I said, Lord, what is the kind of life that Paul taught in the church? And so that's what I want to springboard and talk to you about this morning. Uh, the first one is found in Romans chapter 6. Romans was another epistle, a letter that Paul had written. And it's very simple scripture here that says in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. So when you're talking about this kind of life, I'm going to talk about this concept, new life. Can you write that down? New life. In other words, as a born-again believer, 
as a Christian, as a child of God, as a saint of God, as the old church used to call us, saints of the Most High God, we are living this concept called a new life. The Bible says, I will put, this is what God said, a new spirit within you. The Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. The Bible says, sing unto the Lord a new song. It says, behold, I will do a new thing. The Bible says, and they shall speak with new tongues. How many of you like this one? His mercies are new every morning. Can I just share something with you? And you need to understand this as a believer, and that is you are not some old sinner saved by grace. You have to get the revelation of this. You are not an ex-con. You are not an ex-felon. You are not once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. You are not old Ray Ray from the hood. You're not slick Rick. You're not macaroni Tony. <laughs> because people would like to bring your past up, the old man. But my Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Come on, somebody say this new life. I'm, I'm reminded of this old farmer who took on a new wife, I'm talking about new, he took on a new wife, and uh, so him and his new wife got on their, their, their carriage and their horse to take a journey through the countryside, and so while they were taking their journey, you know, maybe about a half mile out, the horse kind of faltered and stumbled, and, and when he stumbled, the old farmer sat there and he yelled out, that's once, and the horse took off again and went about 50 more yards, and he happened to stumble again, and, and, and he faltered again, and the old farmer yelled out, that's twice. The horse went another 50 yards or so and stumbled for the third time. At this time, the old farmer went up under his seat, pulled out a shotgun, and shot the horse in the head and killed him dead. His new wife looked over at him, and she started screaming, what in the world did you do that for? The old farmer looked at her and said, that's once. Some of y'all get that. <laughs> Everybody shout new life. new life. Here's the interesting thing. I've always said this. Things are only new as long as they're new. And this is somewhat the oxymoron of being a Christian because he's saying that we're to walk in the newness of life. But when you've been saved five years, when you've been saved 10 years, when you've been saved 20 years, when you've been saved as long as I have, almost 30 years, when you've been saved long, there's a tendency or a propensity for things to get old. And there's this, this, this proclivity for things to, to, to get stale or, and, and for you to become complacent and, 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 and bored with this kind of life. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? But the Lord has given us a prescription or a remedy that we can continue to walk in the newness, come on, of life. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? In other words, many of you in here this morning, you didn't walk to church, you drove to church. And that means hopefully you have a driver's license, right? How many of you in here have a driver's license? Okay, you didn't drive here illegally, you have a driver's license. If I was to ask you to pull out your driver's license, you have a time frame on there that tells you when that license will expire. Am I right about that? And then it will behoove you, in other words, it becomes your responsibility to go and renew, oh there it is, renew your license before it expires. In other words, before it becomes too old and becomes obsolete, 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? You have to refresh it or renew it. Uh, come on, talk to me, church. In other words, death is simply the expiration of life. Worry is simply the expiration of peace. Division is simply the expiration of vision. Divorce is simply the expiration of marriage. So the same way you have to renew your license, you have to renew your marriage. The same way you have to renew your license, you have to renew your vision. The same way you have to renew your license, you have to renew your peace. The same way you have to renew your license, you have to renew your relationship with God. The same way you have to renew your license, you have to renew your mind. That's why Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, and be not confused conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Isn't this good? In other words, fresh starts aren't just for first timers. I hope you guys are hearing what your pastor is saying. Fresh starts, in other words, that thing that I do at the end of my message every Sunday, that altar call that I make, sometimes I think that older Christians think that that's just for first-timers. And you stand there not realizing that some things are getting old in your life. You stand there not realizing that some things are about to expire in your life and you don't understand that that is an opportunity for you to come and renew old mindsets. That's an opportunity for you to come and renew old attitudes. That's an opportunity for you to renew old behaviors. That's an opportunity for you to renew what may be about to expire in your life. The way that you continue to walk in the newness of life is to continually go through a renewal and a transformation in your thinking. You have to relearn some things. You have to refresh some things. You Come on, talk to me. You have to rededicate and recommit from time to time in this walk with the Lord. Am I talking to anybody? Somebody shout this kind of life. Well, you can't talk about this kind of life if you're not going to talk about the new life. That's what Paul said. He said that we are to walk in newness, in newness. Everybody say newness, in newness of life. Amen? Okay, Philippians. I love this contemporary English version. Philippians <clears throat> chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 23. He says, I pray that our Lord Jesus Christ will be kind to you and will bless your life. Now, we're talking about this kind of life. I want to talk about this concept, the blessed life. We talked about the new life. Let's talk about the blessed life. Because here's another concept that Paul taught in the church. So remember, he said, this is the kind of life I teach in churches wherever I go. The first concept was new life. The second concept is this blessed life. Everybody say, blessed life. Now, this is going to bless you. This blessed life is getting ready to bless your life. Think about this. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, he says, I set before you blessing and cursing, life and death. He said, now choose life that you and your seed may live. Isn't it interesting that God had to give you a little, little nudge to tell you which one to choose? There's a scripture in Proverbs. It says, there are some who love cursing. Therefore, the blessing is far from them. So God said, I set before you this blessed life, this cursed life. He said, now choose the blessed life so that you and your seed may live. Here's the interesting thing. The blessed life 
or let me say it like this, the blessing and the cursing both speak to the end of a thing. Okay? And if you don't understand this, you can sometimes walk through life as a Christian very discouraged. But you have to understand that the blessing and the cursing both speak to the end of a thing. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Remember when Jacob talked about, uh, or how Esau talked about his brother Jacob had tricked him out of his birthright? You remember that? He was hungry, and Jacob saw that he was hungry, and Jacob went to him and said, man, here's a pot of some soup, here's some stew, and why don't you give me your birthright, and I'll give you this soup, and so on and so forth. And here's what Esau said. He said, he tricked me, or he deceived me out of my birthright. The birthright is what you begin with. In other words, the birthright is yours just from the right of birth. You are the oldest, so it's what you start with. But then if you read the rest of the account or the story, Esau goes on to say, he said, not only have my brother tricked me out of my birthright, he has also taken away my blessing. So the blessing spoke to what Jacob was supposed to end up with. The birthright speaks to what you begin with, but the blessing speaks to what you end up with. The blessing and the cursing both speak to the end of a thing. Okay, y'all following me? When God told Adam, do not eat of the fruit of the tree, the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Adam was disobedient. He caused the curse to come. He ate of the fruit. Did Adam die that day? No, Adam lived hundreds more years later. He didn't die that day because the manifestation of the blessing and the manifestation of the curse is at the end. It speaks to the end of a thing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When Jesus walked up on that fig tree and he cursed that fig tree at the root, it did not die the moment that he cursed it. The Bible says that they left. They went away for a day or two. And it wasn't until they came back by the tree that the disciples had noticed it. And they said, Master, look, the tree that you curse it is dried up at the roots it is dead it is faded away it didn't happen the moment Jesus cursed it because the curse speaks to the end of a thing this is why you have to be watchful if you don't pay your tithes because if you don't pay your tithes God said you're cursed with a curse and sometimes people who don't pay their tithes don't understand this because they still dressing good they still driving good they still get money to go out on Friday night but what they don't realize is that the curse speaks to the end of a thing <laughs> in other words and I hope this doesn't sound funny but in other words sometimes you can be cursed and look blessed and sometimes you can be blessed and look cursed <laughs> because they both speak to the end of a thing. I believe that people looked at Job's life at one portion and didn't believe he was blessed because the blessing speaks to the end of a thing. And how many of you know when it all ended up for Job, he got double, come on, for his trouble. He got twice as much. Come on, I believe that some people looked at Joseph at one portion of his life and didn't believe he was blessed. He's in a pit. How can he be blessed? He's in prison. How can he be blessed? He's in slavery. How can he be blessed? But the blessed life speaks to the end of a thing. Are y'all following what I'm saying right now? In other words, listen to this. I understand people probably looked at Jesus hanging on the cross and didn't believe he was blessed. But the blessing speaks to the end of a thing. Don't get fretful. Don't get discouraged. Don't get weary and well-doing and thinking it's never going to happen for me. My life doesn't look like what pastor preaches about every week because you're just one person part, one portion, one particular place in your life, you got to understand that before it's all said and done, that God is going to do what he said he's going to do in your life because the blessing speaks to the end of a thing. Come on, the Bible says he is going to finish that which he has begun in you and me. The blessing speaks to the end of a thing. 
Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And I need to preach this kind of life, this concept, because the concept that we generally hear about the blessed life is I'm blessed and highly favored. That is a part of it. The concept that we hear about the blessed life is I'm empowered to prosper. And that's true. The concept that we hear about the blessed life is the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow to it. That's true too. The concept we generally hear about the blessed life is I'm blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the field. And that's true too. But I want to flip that coin and tell you there's another concept to this blessed life and I believe it's this when you take the bravery to break through your brokenness that's the blessed life when you got the backbone to believe God when bad things are happening that's the blessed life when you're bold enough to bounce back come on that's the blessed life can I talk to anybody about this kind of life somebody shout the blessed life they say cats have nine lives. I don't know where that came from. I'm not sure how true it is. Maybe it's because when you try to get rid of them, they show up right back up on your doorstep. I don't know why they say cats have nine lives. In other words, they have this ability to bounce back. But one thing I do know about cats is that they have this uncanny ability to land on their feet. Isn't that true? I remember growing up, and we didn't torture animals or anything, but I remember one time growing up, we used to have, we were in this moment where we would take cats, a stray cat, we'd find a cat, and we'd go up on our porch, and we'd grab the cat by all fours, and we'd hang them over the side of the porch, upside down, and we'd drop the cat, and 100% of the time, the cat will flip in mid-air and find his balance and land on his feet. I'm here to tell you that blessed people are like cats. They always have this uncanny ability to land on their feet. Can I talk to some cats? Come on, can I talk to some cats in here right now? In other words, how many of you know what I'm talking about right now? Is there anyone in here who have, knows what it means to fail, but you landed on your feet? Is there anyone in here who knows what it means to fall, but you found your balance in midstream and you landed on your feet? Is there anyone in here who knows what it means to flounder through life, but at the end of the day, you always land on your feet? Can I talk to some cats who knows what it means to land on your feet? To me, that too is the blessed life. Are y'all hearing me? Come on, that's a good place to shout. That's a good place to clap. That's a good place to give God the glory, amen? Lost your job, but you landed on your feet. Lost the account, but you landed on your feet. Got evicted, come on, but you landed on your feet. Just got out of prison, but you landed on your feet. Went through a divorce, but you landed on your feet. Had a repossession, but you landed on your feet. Had a foreclosure but you landed on your feet. Can I talk to somebody? Oh, y'all don't want me on this mic, but you need me on this mic. How many of you know what it means to land on your feet? Praise God. Hey, and Paul had the authority to teach this kind of life because Paul had this uncanny ability to always land on his feet. Paul said we're troubled on every side. He said we're forsaken. He said we're, we've been persecuted. We're perplexed. He said we're even cast down. He said but we're not destroyed because as Christians we always land on our feet. Praise God. Are y'all hearing me? I'm reminded of in the book of Acts, I believe it's verse 27 or chapter 27, when Paul was a prisoner with other prisoners on this ship headed and sailing to Italy. And the Bible said when in the midst of the sea, this hurricane stir up. I knew it was a hurricane because it gave the storm a name. 
It's called the Eucladon. Eucladon. The only reason it got a name is because it's a hurricane. Hurricanes always get names. And it was this hurricane that stirred up. And Paul thought to himself one night, all of us are going to be finished. We're going to die. And so one night, an angel of the Lord came to Paul and spoke to Paul. and said, Paul, tell the men of the ship to steer another direction. And, and the men didn't believe Paul. And then the angel of the Lord said, and tell the men of the ship that they're going to lose the ship. Everything on the ship is going to be destroyed, but the lives of the people will not be lost. They go through the hurricane. The ship is tattered and destroyed, and all kinds of things have been destroyed. And Paul and them ended up landing on dry ground. Their lives have been saved. Here was another example of how Paul always landed on his feet. And the Bible says that when they got to this island, that there were some men on the island who started a fire for them to warm up the men. And now here Paul is fresh off of, out of a hurricane, fresh off of a destroyed boat on dry land. And he goes up to the fire to warm himself in the fire. And when he goes to warm himself in the fire, the Bible says that a snake jumped out and latched itself onto Paul. Paul didn't stand there scared. Paul didn't stand there in shock. Paul didn't stand there and start shouting. You know what Paul did? The Bible says that he shook the snake off because blessed people always land on their feet. I don't think y'all understand what I'm saying. In other words, the difference between you living a blessed life and you living a cursed life is what are you willing to what snakes are you willing to shake off? <laughs> In other words, when fear latches itself onto you, are you going to let it stick or are you going to shake it off? When pride latches itself onto you, are you going to let it stick or are you going to shake it off? When depression latches itself onto you, are you going to let it stick or are you going to shake it off? When lack latches itself onto you, are you going to let it stick or are you going to shake it off? I'm trying to preach to some people in here this morning who says, shake, shake, shake. In other words, it doesn't matter what snakes tried to latch themselves onto me. I am going to take the spirit of Paul and I'm going to shake off everything that is not supposed to stick to my life, somebody ought to shout, shake it off. Paul didn't stand there religiously and start shouting to the Lord. Sometimes we be shouting in church with all kinds of stuff stuck to us. What I'm trying to tell you is that there's some things that you need to shake off right now. There's some lethargicness. Some, there, come on. There's some complacency. Come on. There's some unforgiveness. Come on. There's some attitudes that you've been carrying that you've been letting stick to you for too long. I'm here to say it's time to shake. Shake it off. Come on, shake, shake, shake. Somebody shout, shake it off. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying this morning? In other words, the blessed life is what you bounce back from. The blessed life is you landing on your feet. The blessed life is what you're willing to shake off in your life. Paul said, this is the kind of life that I teach in the church everywhere I go. Not just this concept of a new life, but this concept of a blessed life. I know I'm blessed because of what I've been through. I know I'm blessed because the devil couldn't break me. I know I'm blessed because I haven't been destroyed. I know, I'm, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I'm trying to get you to see the blessing through a new set of lenses. Are you hearing me? Somebody shout, I'm blessed. So he said, this is the kind of life that I want the church to know about. The new life. Everybody shout new life. The blessed life. Everybody say blessed life. Why don't you do me a favor and high five five people and just tell them I'm living the blessed life. Tell them I'm living the blessed life. Isn't that good? Let me give you this last one. Romans. This is all Paul. This is all what Paul taught. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God 
is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we talk about this kind of life, here's a concept that Paul taught in the church, eternal life, new life, the blessed life, and he said eternal life. Eternal means without beginning or end. It means always existing. It means from everlasting to everlasting. It means timeless. It means immortal, eternal. And I began to pray about this, and I believe the Holy Spirit said to me in my prayer time, as I'm meditating on this message, he gave me a definition of eternal life. Because I just gave you a definition of eternal and what it means, and we understand that, but I want to give you what the Holy Spirit shared with me, his definition of eternal life. And it is forever with the Father. Yeah, this is good. Forever with the Father. Can I teach for the last five minutes here? Death is simply separation from the Father. Death is separation from God. In other words, it's n once you were born, in other words, let me go back a step further. Once God spoke you into existence, pneuma, spirit, zoe, life, then what God did is that he gave you a mom and a daddy so that you can be birthed into the earth. You, you are already formed as a person, all right, when he spoke you into existence. But you cannot come into the earth without coming through the womb of a woman. You, you have to take on flesh. You understand? And so you took on flesh so that you can occupy this earth realm. Without flesh, you're illegal in the earth. That's why God couldn't even come into the earth without being born of a woman. He had to take on a body so that he can occupy earth. It's like you can't go to the moon without an earth suit. You won't be able to navigate on the moon without an earth suit. You can't legally navigate in the earth without your earth suit, which is your body. You hear this? So when God created you, when God spoke your name, spoke you into existence, you became a living spirit. A spirit can never, ever die. So when your body ceases to exist, your spirit leaves to be absent from the body. Come on, talk to me. Yes. Is to be present yes. with the Lord yes. if you're a believer. You're a believer. Right. This is why the Bible says strange things like how beautiful the death of a saint is in the eyes of the Lord. How in the world does God see death as beautiful? Because he says how beautiful the death of a saint is. Because God knows that when you cease to exist in your body, absent from the body means present with the Lord. Eternal life is forever with the Father. Are y'all following me so far? So you never ever die. You just choose where you're going to live in eternity. And the Bible says that if you do not choose God, if you're separated from God, that's considered spiritual death, even though you still exist. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's an oxymoron because I begin to think about it when he says eternal life is forever with the Father. There's some things that we need to understand about the power of the Father. 
Jesus said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. He said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You can't get to the Father by Mohammed. You can't get to the Father by Buddha. You can't get to the Father by Allah. You can't get to the Father by being a Hare Krishna. You can only get to the Father through the Son. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying right now. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now, here's the oxymoron. 80% of single-parent households are run by the mother and not the father. 24 million children, one out of every three, live without their biological father in the home. 63% of child suicides occur from homes that do not have a father. 90% of children who choose to run away or become homeless come from homes that do not have a father. 71% of pregnant teenagers lack a father. 80% of rapists with anger problems come from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth in prison come from fatherless homes homes. According to 72% of the United States population, fatherlessness is the most significant family or social problem facing America. The problem in the earth is the promise in eternity. Forever with the Father. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, 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 eternal life is not just occupying my mansion in heaven. Eternal life is not just walking barefooted on streets of gold. Eternal life is not just reconnecting with my family and friends who have gone on and died in the Lord. These are all wonderful things. Eternal life is not just no more death. It's not just no more sorrow. It's not just no more tears. It's not just no more pain. Eternal life is not just forfeiting hell and escaping the flames and the lake of fire. Eternal life is forever with the Father. Wow. The last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, the last chapter of that book and the last verse of that chapter says this. I'm going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Talking to you about the power of the father. And for many of us in here, I'm not going to even ask you to raise your hand about who don't know their father, who didn't grow up with their father, who didn't have their father in their home. Because earth's problem is eternity's promise. Eternal life is forever with the Father. Before I close, let me give you an earthly story that depicts this to the T. It's very interesting because there's a natural story that depicts this spiritual truth, and it's with the prodigal son. The prodigal son was in his father's house. He went to his father and he said, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth unto me. He got a portion of his inheritance. He left the father. The moment he left the father, 
spiritual death started to sink in. He started living lowly. He started wasting his money in riotous living, living wild, spending it with prostitutes, hanging out with the druggies, hanging out. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Till one day, we talked about it last week, he came to himself. And what did he say? He said, I will arise and go back to my father. Y'all following me? Y'all tracking with me? He's going to go back to who? The Father. He goes back to the Father. The Father says, bring the fatted calf. Put a ring on his feet. Put some shoes on it. Let's make merry. Let's party, y'all. The older son hears the music, and he comes out, and he says to his father, why are we throwing a party? Listen to what the father says. My son who was once dead is alive again. Did he ever physically die? No, because separation from the Father is spiritual death. And he said, my son who was lost is now found. He was dead, but he's alive again. The older son says, why are you doing this for him? He left you. He spent his money. He did all this wild stuff. He said, I've always been a good son. The father turns to him. You know what he says? He says, you have forever been with me. All that is mine is thine. Because eternal Life is forever with the Father. I don't know about you this morning, but there's absolutely no way I would miss out on the opportunity to live forever with the Father. It's difficult to fathom forever in your finite mind because your mind will always go to time. You don't understand what it means to burn forever. In other words, if you went home and turned the stove on and put your hand in the fire, you're going to feel the heat and the flame only for about 90 seconds. After a while, you become what's called cauterized. This is what the Bible means when it says that their conscience should be seared with a hot iron. In other words, in other words, when you do something bad, you feel it, but after a while you don't feel it no more. It's called cauterization because the nerve endings and whatever has been burnt up and you don't even feel it no more. Your conscience don't even feel bad for doing bad no more. That's bad. But he says not when you go to hell. The same way it felt the first two seconds you put your hand in the fire, that's how it's going to feel for eternity. The Bible says that the worm, it can never be quenched. It can never be put out. The pain can never be satisfied. You can choose that. Or you can choose to sit around the throne. See, here's the thing. Your finite mind, forever, forever. Like, you don't, do you want to live forever in the earth? You think you do, but do you? Because you can't even fathom forever. And I get to think, how am I going to live forever with God? What, what is there to do in heaven forever? Am I going to get bored in heaven forever? Forever, not 100, not 200, not 500 years, not 15,000 years, forever. But God is so big, God is so vast that it's going to take an eternity to get to know him. (laughs) 
I'm getting ready to close. I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to talk to you about our bigness and how vast God is. That the, the God that we serve is the creator of not only the heavens and the earth, but the universe. Every planet out there, God spewed into existence. The Bible says heaven is his throne and earth is where he sets his feet. It's his footstool. Talk about how big God is. You think you ain't going to have something to do in heaven forever? The Bible says he created the stars and he flung them out, just to, and flung out the stars in the universe, and they are innumerable. You can't even count them. You can't even count them, and the smallest one is the sun. <laughs> And the sun is nine times as big as the earth. And there's so many of them out there, you can't even count them. I used to think by when I sit in my bedroom and look out at the stars at night, how long will it take to get there? You can never get there. Not to a star. I used to think, oh, once you get on the moon, you may be about 200 miles from a star. You understand how my mind works? Did your mind work like that? Oh, if you get on Jupiter, maybe you can almost, almost, you know, touch a star. Mm -mm. The star is just as far from Jupiter as it is from the Earth. This is the kind of God we serve. I'm just trying to give you a glimpse of what it's going to be forever with the Father. Man, who wouldn't choose this kind of life. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Come on, stand to your feet. I can preach this all morning, man. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Come on, if you get anything from it, shout hallelujah. Thank you for watching this message from Pastor Lonnie Key. We trust that you've been moved by the message. If you'd like to give a donation to the ministry, please go to our website, kingdomchristiancenter.com, and click on the Donate tab, which will allow you to give. Your giving allows us to impact lives with the good news of Jesus Christ. Again, thanks for connecting with us, and we hope to connect again soon.